Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi Muhammadin wa alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in Amma ba'du fa'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Wa idh yamkuru bika alladhina kafaru liyuthbituka aw yaqtuluka aw yukhrijuk وَيَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَظِيمِ Alhamdulillah, all praises are for Allah Azza wa Jalla. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has blessed us to complete this period of time which is the season of Hajj and Qurbani but more so we are coming down to the end of the month of Zul Hijjah. With Muharram, a new month does not only enter, but an entire new year enters. This is a period of time that Muslims shall feel happy. And that joy that is expressed, and that happiness that is expressed when the 1st of Janu January enters, it should be more for the Muslims when the first of Muharram enters. As Muslims, we are also taught in Islam by the Prophet wasallam to appreciate what Allah has given to you. We Muslims still have to come out from the feeling happy on the day of Sunday and feel happier on the day of Jumu'ah. Because Jummah is the king of all the days. Jummah is the best day of the week. Jummah is the Eid of the week. Subhanallah. This is the day that Allah has officially ordered that when you hear the Adhan for Jummah, every trade, occupation and work now becomes haram for you. Leave everything and hasten towards the masjid for the dhikr of Allah which is the Jummah. Allah says in the Holy Quran, إِذَا نُودِيَ لِلصَّلَاةِ مِنْ يَوْمِ الْجُمَعَةِ When the call to prayer is made on the day of Jumu'ah, فَسَعَوْ إِلَى ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَذَرُ الْبَيْ Then hasten towards that call, Jumu'ah, and leave of trade and transactions and buying and selling and work and every type of occupation. For no other salat, not even Eid, such a command was revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Eid is great. Jummah is greater than Eid. Because Jummah is farz. An entire surah was revealed called Surah Al-Jumu'ah. But that was not revealed for Eid. So this is why we as Muslims, whatever is connected to us, we should build that happiness and joy into our hearts and make ourselves feel happy and train ourselves because the human being has the ability to train himself. If he doesn't train himself, he can just remain like that, idle. If he trains himself to become a runner, he becomes a runner. He trains himself to become a scientist, he becomes a scientist. He trains himself to become anything in the world. He becomes like that. And so to us Muslims, if we train ourselves to recognize and appreciate whatever Allah has given to us, uh, we will definitely show more appreciation and value to that. What is the first day of the week? Subhanallah. It is Sunday. Yawmul Ahad. The first day. And Saturday is the last day. When... Hadith recorded by Imam Bukhari states that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Ahlul Kitab the choice to make. Choose one day of the week where you will come together and praise and glorify Allah. You see, because heavenly scriptures were revealed to prophets in the past. Revelation directly from Allah. Jibreel alayhi salam did not only come to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He came to Isa alayhi salam. He came to Musa alayhi salam. He came to Ibrahim alayhi salam. He came to Nuh alayhi salam. All the prophets in the past. And Allah gave them a choice. That during the week of seven days. 
adopt one day where you will leave your work and leave everything and everybody will come together and collectively praise Allah, make the hamd of Allah, make the tasbih of Allah, glorify Allah and pray to Allah, worship Allah. It was placed in the hands of the Jews. So they thought about which day can we take? They said, according to their scriptures, however, and in whatever way this, this uh, teaching found itself inside there, Allah alone knows what is wrong. They said, you know what? God created the heavens and the earth in six days, and he rested on the seventh day. So we are also going to rest on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, Saturday. And they call it the Sabbath day. That started from the time of Dawood alayhi salam before. And what was upon them that the day they have chosen to come together and praise Allah and glorify Allah. For that entire day they were not able to work, go to work or do business. The entire day had to be for that purpose. And Allah tested them through Dawood alayhi salam. Allah tested them that they choose to celebrate the Sabbath day, the seventh day. So you have the seventh day Adventists. It came from this teaching also that they will stop all trade and they will, the seventh day is the day for what? Glorifying God Almighty. And they were, it was haram for them to do what? Haram for them to do any work. Their job was to gather together and please and glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they started that, the people of Dawood alayhi salam, and they were not allowed to do trade. So what happened? Allah decided to test them. And uh, until the day before Saturday, Friday, they will go to work, they will go in the ocean, they will go in the rivers, they will do their catch, they were fishermen, many of them, they will catch. Sometimes it will be difficult like fishermen. On the day of Saturday, Allah mentions that. Allah told the Prophet, rehearse to them the incident of the Saturday. Tell them about Ashab, Sab, the companions of the Saturday. What was that about? Mentioned in the Quran. On the Saturday, Allah will allow all the fishes to now come and swim on the surface of the water. And this dazzled them. Because for the whole week, a fisherman, his wealth is fishes. Isn't that so? You, are, you cannot catch the fish. It's difficult. Like any fisherman will go, you throw your hook or you, you trawl with the net and you are not catching anything now. On Saturday, when it was prohibited for them to fish, which was their job, that was the day, it was the easiest day to catch a fish because everything started to come and swim on the surface of the water. And they are looking at that and they are saying, but it is haram, we can't fish. <laughs> it's haram for us. But we can't miss this day. <laughs> if we miss this day, then we're going to find it difficult to catch. So what they did is they said, okay, we are not going to fish on a Saturday because that's haram for us. This is the, the followers of Dawood, Prophet David. So they said, but what we're going to do is that on a Saturday, when it comes up, we will dig small drains and canals that are connected to this river and guide the fish to go into the end and block it. So on the Sunday, whatever went on on that side, like the drain, we will pick up everything on that side there. So we are not fishing, we are, we are just opening up these small little drains. So they did that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is what you call a strategy. On one hand, you want to obey the law, but you really want to break the law. You want to break the law. And this type of strategy to make haram that which is, to make halal that which is haram is totally haram in Islam. You know, and sometimes Muslims use strategies also to, to actually avoid the law of Allah coming upon them. So they did that. Allah revealed to Dawood alayhi salam that they have slipped and they have violated the law. Tell them that Allah will give them three days time to repent to him and mend their ways. And repent to Allah for what they have done. But they didn't listen. 
Allah mentions in the Quran and this is in the Torah and this is in the Injil, this is in the Old Testament and New Testament and in the book of Moses and in the book of Isa. After treaties, all those people who got involved in doing that, Allah changed them and disfigured them, mutilated their bodies and he changed them into apes and monkeys. The whole body was changed. Subhanallah. And they were looking at their own brothers and sisters. Uh, and when they looked at them, they started to cry because they did not obey Allah. And after a few days, because of that, Dawood ordered them to go on the other side of the river and live. Don't mix with the other people. They went there and then one morning they got up. They did not hear anybody, they did not see anybody moving about. When they looked for them, they all died. Subhanallah. They all fell dead after a few days. And Allah reminded people in the Holy Quran and reminded and sent an ayah, remind these Ahlul Kitab, the people of the book, of what happened to the people of the Sabbath day, the, the Saturday. So they chose that day, subhanallah. And yet they violated the day. And when that choice was given to the followers of Isa alayhi salam, the people at the time of Isa alayhi salam, they said, Allah has given us a day to choose to celebrate His praises and to glorify Him. So we will take the Sunday because it is the first day and that is the day when Allah started the creation of everything, the heavens and the earth. So we will take that day. So they took the Sunday. And so the Sunday became sacred for the Christians because they took it. And the Saturday... The Sabbath became holy for the Jews. Hadith recorded by Imam Bukhari in the very beginning chapter of Kitabul Jumu'ah, the book of Jumu'ah. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Allah also gave us a choice, but Allah did not leave it for us to decide which day." He said, "Fahadan Allahu lihad al yom." Allah guided us to this day, the day of Jumu'ah. Allah guided our hearts. Allah inspired us to which day is the best day. So they were given a choice. It was subjected to their thinking. They made the wrong choice. The Jews made the wrong choice. The Christians made the wrong choice. And Allah guided our hearts to making the correct, the cho correct choice. The Prophet ﷺ said, And so Allah guided us to adopt the day of Jumu'ah. And so, Jumu'ah, the day of Jumu'ah is Sayyidul Ayyam. It is the leader of all the days of the week. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ says, There is no other day of the week, subhanAllah, that is better than the day of Jumu'ah. The best day on which the sun had risen on or has risen on is the day of Jumu'ah. And we have the Jumu'ah. So we have to, this is why. In the book of Jummah, Kitab al Jummah, Imam Bukhari mentioned a, a great amount of narrations of the adab, the etiquettes, and the manners uh, to be observed by Muslims on the day of Jummah alone. Etiquettes that you are required to do, to implement, to put. Why? Because it is the day of Jummah, the best day, the, the prince of the day is the leader of all the days. So the topic is this, that subhanallah, the new year that is coming in now, this is a time that is the Islamic new year. It is the year that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made for us to become happy about, starting with Muharram. And whenever the Islamic year is used, as I just mentioned here, you will always see the word A-H after it. And all the other years, that went by, A-H means after Hijra. In Arabic, Hijra. Al-Hijri. So you have Al-Iswi with the Ayn, yani the Christian uh, uh, the, the years that we follow based upon when it started to be counted. But we have A-H which is after Hijra. And my dear beloved brothers and my dear sisters, what it tells us, that the counting of the years in the Islamic calendar, it started with the Hijrah. So way back in the beginning, there was a 1 AH. And there was a 2 AH. 
and there was a 3 AH and a 4 AH. It all started, everything starts from one, subhanallah. What is this hijrah about? This hijrah, we have heard and we know, it literally means migration. And it is the migration of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the early Muslims from the best land on the face of the earth, the greatest piece of land on the face of the earth, from the most holiest place of all places on the earth, the Kaaba, migration from that place to the land of Medina, that is the migration. But what we must understand, my dear beloved brothers and my dear sisters, is that this migration, migration literally means to leave one place to go to another place and settle in that place. What we must understand that this migration was not done intentionally. It was not done willfully. This migration, this which is known as the Hijrah, it was so essential upon the Muslims that whosoever did not undertake that migration was either an unbeliever or a munafiq. Those who were excused were the very old people who could not travel on a mount like a horse or a camel to cover the distance from Makkah to Medina or the very young children who could not undertake that journey at all. Migration at that time was essential. And not only essential, but migration at that time was such a great act of ibadah and worship that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself said, Al-hijratu tahdimu ma kana qablahu The hijrah that the Muslims undertook at his time, it washed away all the sins of that person that were committed before hijrah. You know, we hear that when a person accepts Islam, all his past sins are forgiven, isn't that so? That's one thing. When a person accepts Islam, all his past sins are forgiven by Allah. So too, in the same way, whoever undertook the hijrah, the migration with the Prophet wasallam, that washed away all the sins of the people before. Al-hijratu tahdimu makana qablaha. It washed away. This is why it was very great. But what I was mentioning is that this was not a migration or a travel that the Prophet wasallam and the Muslims, the early Muslims, they sat together and they thought about it and they had a mashwara or a consultation and they came up with the idea, you know what, let's go to Medina. And they all decided to go. No, my dear beloved brothers and my dear sisters, they were actually expelled and driven out from the holiest land on the face of the earth, which is Makkah al mukarramah This is what happened. They were chased out. They were driven out from the most holiest land. So much so that when the Prophet ﷺ was migrating and leaving Makkah, he went up on a hilltop and looked at the holy Kaaba because the Kaaba was there since the time of Ibrahim salam, reconstructed and built. It came at the time of Noah um, Adam salam. It was built with a structure, but with the great deluge and flood of Noah salam, all the walls became weak and it just went away and only a small hump remained on its spot. Noah salam, was the second Nabi of Allah. We are talking about the beginning of human beings on the face of the earth. So Noah alayhi salam now, with that great flood that took the world and washed away everything, the Kaaba, the walls of the Kaaba went with it. And the black stone that came from Jannah remained there on the hum that, that actually was raised off the ground. And this is why the times passed, there were ambiyas between him and Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam was born in Iraq. He grew up as a young boy in Iraq. But because Allah ordered him to invite towards Tawheedah, the oneness of Allah, and his father was the biggest pagan and idolater, making images for people to worship his fire, expelled him and kicked him out from his house. And his father said, Ibrahim, my son, 
If you don't stop what you are doing with this invitation, I will stone you, I will kick you out, I will kill you. Ibrahim alayhi salam then left. He did not know where he was going. What did he say? Inni muhajirun ila rabbi. I am migrating to my Lord. He will guide me. Without knowing where he was going. Can you imagine the damn world what it was like? Uncivilized, rocks and mountains, no human beings living anywhere, no water, no water hole, no trees. And he's just going in the wilderness. And Allah guided him and guided him and guided him until he reached in the land of Philistine. He settled there, but that was not it. Allah wanted him to do one of the greatest work and khidmah on the face of the earth. That Kaaba, the walls which were destroyed, Allah wanted him to reconstruct that. So Allah now ordered him to leave Palestine and by mount, walking at times on the horse, on the camel back, reach the, the land of Hijaz. And he and his son reconstructed the holy Kaaba. And when he settled his family there in Hijaz, in the land of Makkah, in the valley of Makkah, Allah told him, your mission is Philistine. He went back to Palestine. And there is where he had his second son, Ishaq alayhi salam. And all the Bani Israel and the Israelites came from the progeny of who? Isaac, Ishaq alayhi salam. And his first son, Ismail alayhi salam, was left with his mother, Hajra, where? In Makkah. And so all the Arabs came from Ismail alayhi salam. So the Ismailites, Banu Ismail, the children of Ismail, their grandfather is Ibrahim, and Banu Ishaq, the children of Ishaq, they are cousins. The Israelites and the Ismailites and the Arabs and the Israelites are cousins. Children of two brothers. The grandfather is the same. The greatest, one of the greatest Nabi, the friend of Allah, Ibrahim alayhi salam. And history tells us the rest. Until today, subhanallah, what has happened between these. And if we trace the history back, it is because of the envy in the people, again. Because of the fact that the children of Ishaq, their grandchildren and great-grandchildren started to boast that their great-grandfather Ishaq was Zabihullah, was the one offered as a sacrifice. And the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of Ismail said, no, their grandfather was Zabihullah. So you have a difference there. It started here. Subhanallah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, he sent Ibrahim alayhi salam to a different place. And Ismail alayhi salam grew up now to become the prophet of those people there. In the land of Makkah, in the land of Medina, subhanallah. And all the surrounding tribes, subhanallah, like Yemen and these places. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he stood looking at the Kaaba. That's the point we reached at. And he said, he cried. And he said, if it was not that my people, they, they expelled me and they are chasing me out of this land, I would not have left you. By Allah, I swear, you are the best piece of land on the face of the earth. He was speaking to the what? The Kaaba. And so he was taken away. In other words, he was expelled. And he was chased. And so when life became difficult to be lived in Makkah, that's when the Prophet ﷺ and his people left the holy city of Makkah. When we go straight back to the beginning, when the Prophet ﷺ, from the time he got Nabuwat and Allah made him a Nabi, he started to secretly invite towards Islam. So those people who were his closest friends like Abu Bakr, he invited him within the walls of the house. Ali radiallahu ta'ala and within the walls of the house. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, his wife. The closest blood relatives. Nobody could have known about it. And then, subhanallah, three years passed like this. The hijrah took place 13 years after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam received the message from Allah to become a Nabi. 13 years after Islam entered at that time, 13 years after that, then the migration took place. 
So 1445 and 1446 only tells us the amount of years until Hijrah. But there is 13 years before that from the time the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got the first wahi when Allah made him a Nabi and told him that his job was to invite people. But first of all, he was ordered to invite and tell his immediate family members, not to make it public. And for three years, it continued like that. And only a very, very few people you can count on your fingers because he was not given and making his Islam public. Because the religion of the people in Mecca was paganism. They were polytheists. They worshipped many, many idols. They carved their own idols. They made their own idols. The Kaaba was filled with approximately 360 idols they worshipped. They even had a picture of Ibrahim alayhi salam. They had a picture of Ismail alayhi salam inside the Kaaba. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is now told that he is a Nabi of Allah. He has to be careful. And from this we learn a very important thing. Not every time you are given a duty that you just go public and you announce it when uh, there is a lot of opposition around you. Subhanallah, very beautiful hikmah. Not because you are on haq, it means that you will now fight from day one. <laughs> no. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was always on the truth. But for three years, he did not publicize that. And that was by the command of Allah. Three years he's working among his own immediate people. Few people. Then Allah, after three years now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayah to him by saying, Fasda' bima tu'mar wa a'rid anil mushrikeen. Now proclaim what you have been ordered to do and turn away from the polytheists. Turn away from the what? The mushrikeen. And Allah also revealed, وَأَنذِرَ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِ Now, O my Prophet, now is the time you have to invite and you have to proclaim the message and warn the people who are your relatives and the further family members. And Allah also revealed to him, يَا أَيُّهَا الْمُدَّثِّرُ قُمْ فَأَنذِرُ O thou wrapped up in a mantle and blanket, قُمْ Stand up, arise, وَأَنذِرُ and, and warn the people now. When those verses were revealed after three years, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam now he's realized. Now he realized it is not now a secret mission. It has to be publicized. Three years, three years of Nabuwat have gone already, but he is only within the, the household. He has not proclaimed that yet. So when Allah revealed those verses, now he understands that he must now invite everybody. So what he does? He was the most respected, the most trustworthy, the most honest man in the whole of Makkah. You couldn't find a better man like than him in the whole of Makkah, in the city of Makkah. All the people in Makkah, they used to call him Al-Amin, the most trustworthy, the most truthful person. Everybody loved him the most. So he called all the tribes because they lived in tribes. And he was from the Quraysh. He was from Banu Hashim. They were the the, the biggest, the best, the most noble tribe in Makkah. He called all the tribes and gathered them. Subhanallah. Sitting close to a hill. Everybody, they were all family members. They were all tribesmen. They loved him dearly. They respected him. Most of them didn't know yet that he was a prophet. They all came. He said, if I am to tell you on the other side of this mountain... Or this hill, there is an army waiting to charge on you. Waiting to attack you, to kill you. Will you believe me? They said, yes. We will certainly believe you. You have never ever spoke a lie in your life. You are the prince of truth. We will never disbelieve you. We will believe you. He said, well, let me tell you, Allah has chosen me as a prophet and Allah has ordered me to tell you that there is no God but Him and worship Him alone. 
awe as soon as he said that. The people fell on him from all sides. His own blood uncle, Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab, subhanallah, was so happy when this, per, this Muhammad sallallahu was born. He even sacrificed animals and he also freed female slaves in joy and happiness. He loved him dearly. He was called Abu Lahab. Lahab means what? Flames. You know when you light a fire and the fire starts to rise and you see the flame, the flame is sometimes blue and pink and reddish. That's the flame. He was called the father of flame because he was extremely handsome. This is why he's called Abu Lahab, the father of flames. Arab, pure Arab. Abu Abu Lahab was his name. He stood up. He looked at his own nephew. He said, Taballaka ya Muhammad. O Muhammad, may your hands perish and may you be destroyed. Ali hadha jama'atana. This is why you collected us and guarded us today for this. This is anything that you, you will gather all these big tribes and elites and noblemen to come here and hear what you are saying? Are you mad? Are you insane? He's speaking to his nephew. May you perish. May your hands be destroyed. Taballaka ya Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him an answer. How did Allah give him an answer? Allah revealed to the Prophet. Tabbat yada abi lahabin watab. Oh. You are saying, may the hands of Muhammad perish? Allah is saying, may the hands of Abu Lahab be destroyed. And may he be destroyed. Subhanallah. And that was revealed to answer Abu Lahab. But it became part of the Quran. And until the day of judgment, every time you read that and I read that, it's like a curse against Abu Lahab. That's the type of curse Allah has given to Abu Lahab. And then now, the message, subhanallah, has started. The Rasul of Allah knew there will be consequences. The people who like what he said. The people so, uh, they are so deep in what they were doing of committing shirk, they just could not tolerate any man saying, worship one God and leave all of these gods. And so, subhanallah, when he started, it didn't stop. Meaning when he started to invite people, the Sahabas narrate in some of these traditions recorded by Imam Bayhaqi, Imam Bayhaqi, Imam, uh, Imam Bayhaqi, Imam Muslim, Imam Al Bayhaqi, all of these narrations that the people they are saying, those who were early Muslims, they say, I can remember I was looking at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam going to the marketplace of Zul Majaz and saying to the people, Ayyuhan Nasu, Kulu la ilaha illallah, Tuflihu, O people, just say la ilaha illallah, just say there is no God but Allah and you will be successful. And behind him, people will be pelting him with stones and boulders and there will be others throwing garbage on his face and there will be others spitting on his face and he will just bend down saying the same thing again and again I saw him, the sahaba said, I saw him walking through the corridor of some people and he was saying the same thing and people were running after him and pelting him from the back and saying, oh people, don't listen to this madman, this man is insane, he's bewitched and this is this is what has started to happen to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Mockery, ridicule, persecution from all sides started. Subhanallah. And then after that, not only that, the Sahabas radiallahu ta'ala anhum, those who accepted Islam, they were persecuted also. They were persecuted. On one occasion, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, on one occasion, publicly, they beat him so much, he fell unconscious, unconscious on the ground. He fell unconscious. They had to lift him up. They started to beat Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr fell unconscious also. Imam Bukhari recorded the tradition, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, during the beginning period, he went to the Kaaba. And he started to perform two rakat salat. And all these elites of the Quraysh, they were there, looking at each other, they say, who is so brave to go and take up the carcass, the intestines of the slaughtered camel that lay under the side of the street, pick it up and put it on the back of this man Muhammad when he goes for Saja? Who is so brave? An infidel by the name of Uqba bin Abi Mu'ayd got up. Say, I'll do it. They said, yes, you can do it. He went there. 
You know, they used to slaughter the animals. And you know, the belly, what we say, the stomach and intestine, they will put it at the side of the road. Two or three days will pass. It will give off a bad stench, the flies. So that is what he went to get. Salah jazurin in Arabic. The hadith recorded by Imam Bukhari says. And he went and he picked it up. And he brought it. And he waited. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went into sajda, he placed it on the back of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was so heavy he could not move. Abdullah bin Mas'ud was the only Muslim there looking on. He said, by Allah, I wish I had the strength to move it and to fight against these people. But I was alone and there were many. They will kill me. All he did is he ran off and he went to Fatima. Fatima was a little girl and said, Oh, Fatima, go and see what they are doing to your father. Fatima radiallahu ta'ala left the home. She ran, she ran, she ran. She is the one who came and moved it from his back. And then he got up. And when he got up, he looked at them. He looked at them and he says, Allahumma alayka bi Quraysh. Oh Allah, I beg you to deal with the Quraysh. And he named them one by one. And he made dua against them. And they were all killed afterwards in the battle of Badr. Said, I saw the Sahabi, says another Sahabi, I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once performing salat in the haram. In the Kaaba, right in front of the Kaaba. And one of those people and believers came with a piece of cloth and started to choke him until he started to strangle him. That the Rasul of Allah fell unconscious. And one after the other in this way. As for the other Sahaba, subhanallah, subhanallah. If we hear Khabab ibn al-Arrat radiallahu ta'ala What they used to do with this Sahabi? Khabab ibn al-Arrat radiallahu ta'ala they will take burning charcoal. They will put it on the fire. It will become red. They will put it on the ground. They will strip off his upper garment from the back. And they will actually make him lie down on it. And they will rest their feet on his chest. So they will push him straighter down. Subhanallah. So much so. During the Khilafat of Umar radiallahu ta'ala. When he asked Khabab of some of the times he had to go through. He says, oh Khabab, let me see your back. When he looked at the back of Khabab, he says, Wallahi, by Allah, I have never seen a back like that in my life. Subhanallah. And these Sahabas, one after the other, they had to go through the worst, the worst type of beating, persecution, and a tyranny from the hands of those people who were the elites in Makkah. And it is these things, my dear beloved brothers and my dear sisters, it is these things that it built up, it carried on and carried on and carried on and went higher and higher until after 13 years of persecution and torture, and many of the Muslims, they lost their lives because of that, the early Muslims, only because of the fact that they accepted Islam. It is upon this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then ordered the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to migrate and move away from this land of persecution. Holiest place on the face of the earth, but the land of persecution. Makkah was what we know, those who know the Arabic language, Darul Harb. Darul Harb means the land of the enemies. That was the name of Makkah in those days. They persecuted and tortured the Muslims, subhanAllah. And Allah ordered the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to migrate. So these are the things that surrounded the what? The migration. Our time has come to an end today. But inshallah we will continue. We will continue with this topic. So we will see where, subhanallah, what they did, the, the, the mashwara or the consultation they had as to how they will get rid of Islam and kill it forever. And when they, in an enclosed, in enclosed area, made the decision, it's time to wipe out Muhammad. It is time to slay Muhammad. It is time to kill him. And kill him, and Islam will uh, die forever. And upon that, subhanAllah, Allah revealed ayats of the Holy Quran, telling us about what took place at that time. So these things are, are mentioned to us. These things are written in the books of history. So that when we read it, we'll be reminded of the sacrifices that the early Muslims give so that Islam could reach down to us today. We practice Islam. We can recite the kalima publicly. You can go in any gathering and take a mic and say, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. Nobody will tell you anything. 
but you could do that in the days gone by at the time of the Sahabas. Allah has elevated and honored Islam. And this is why it is our duty to protect it as much as we can in each and every single way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with the love for Islam and may Allah bless us also with the ability to sacrifice and protect it as long as we live on the face of the earth. <coughs>